I will start with the, with the quote from uh, one of our favorite uh, composers, musician Yanni. And he said that you cannot control creativity. You cannot control it. You, know? you have to surrender to it. It is very counterintuitive. You, know, you think you have grasped, grasped creativity, but in reality you could not. Creativity is like a butterfly. You need to close your eyes, extend your hands, and imagine it landing right here in your hands. And it does. And when it does, it's magic. So today, uh, we'll talk about the magic of the mind we have seen in play. So Challenge Chambers is a real life escape game where we lock people inside into a closed room and we give them one hour to make their way out. So they are locked in the room, cut out from the outside world, but they have to solve different logical and mental puzzles to make their way out of that room. Why this idea came about? Uh, the reason behind, behind the whole idea was we found out that you know, as we are progressing towards technology, bringing new technology in, we are leaning more and more towards convenience. For example, calculators, they have taken the mental arithmetic out of it. Earlier, if you want to ask somebody what is 2 plus 2, they would say 4. Now, oh, let me take my calculator out and, and, and do, you know, maybe it's 2 plus 2, 5 or it's 4, I'm not sure. So that's the reason, you know, we brought Challenge Chambers in. We wanted to bring old school back and tell people that, you know, our mind is still there, but we are not using it as much as we want it to. So that's the concept behind Challenge Chambers. So basically we design our games to ensure that people use their minds more and more. Um, and how the mind performs in such a stressful environment, that depends per individual as per individual. Um, the first thing we have is we do take away cell phones when you go into the room. So the first thing we see is the cell phone separation <laughs> anxiety. I only experienced it when I left my daughter at school. So basically, when you're inside the room, it's you, your teammates, and your mind that will be playing tricks and uh, will be challenging you on a very different level and then at a level that you would be like, what's going on here? Yeah. And we have observed, and it, it's, a, it's a very interesting observation that given a same set of problems or situations, different minds, different people react to them completely differently and sometimes they solve that puzzle in a way where even we have never expected that you know people would do it and you know and then we say wow it's magic how, how did they think about it how, how did, did they come about that so close your eyes and imagine that you've been thrown into a chamber you have an hour to get out it's a do or die situation so, and you have no help from the outside world. It's just you, yourself, and your mind. So the question becomes, will your mind guide you or mislead you? So in the, in the upcoming slides, you know, we'll share some of our experiences, our observations on how our mind plays tricks on us, but also creates magic. So these are our live experiences, live observations, having been in business and, you know, dealing with multiple uh, people from multiple walks of life, different cultures, different backgrounds, and uh, we hope that you know you enjoy and uh, experience what we have experienced, and we bring a flavor to what we have done. You remember that time when you go to your husband and say, "Honey, can I borrow the keys to your car?" And the answer you're expecting is either no or a line of questioning, but he goes like, "Sure, honey, take it." And you're like, "Okay." You're happy for a second, but then you realize, "Oh God, why did he say yes? He didn't ask me where I'm going." Is he having an affair? Is he hiding something? <laughs> so it can't be that easy. So what has your mind done at this point in time? It's overcomplicated something that was very, very simple. Well, in essence, your husband was like, just take the car and go. I want to just enjoy TV and a beer. So, <laughs> so it's one of those situations. So it's basically how we define hard and easy effect is when the mind tends to complicate the easiest and simplest of things when it's not necessary. A classic, um, implementation is that in challenge chambers we actually do put in a, a very easy puzzle that in, in, in essence reflects 
the hard easy effect. So what happens is you'll solve a puzzle, you'll get the right answer, but you'll be like, you'll discard it immediately saying it's too easy. It can't be that easy. It cannot be that easy. And then you move on. Well, in essence, it can be that easy, but your mind is just playing a trick on you. So we've also done a test on this. We had two identical puzzles set out for two separate teams. The logic behind the puzzle was to find a four letter, uh, to discover four letters in the room, which would spe spell the word lamp, and that that would lead you to a lamp. So how did two different teams behave to it? Team one found the words, arranged them, figured out it was lamp, walked to the lamp in the room and progressed into the game. Whereas team two figured out the word lamp, looked at the lamp, said, it's too easy, it can't be this, it has to be something else. They did not progress in the game. So they have just overcomplicated a situation. The next one is uh, neglect of probability. You're locked in a room, there are things which are locked, right? And classical thing is that, you know, there's a lock. Now, how do we open a lock? We have to find a key. So neglect of probability is a cognitive bias, whereby people disregard probability when making a decision under uncertainty. So they're locked in a room, they have to open the lock, and they know they have to solve puzzles to do it. So the hard easy effect comes into mind, oh, it cannot be that easy. But neglect of probability is that people actually disregard probability that the solution to an answer can be right there in front of their eyes. For example, in this picture, we have actually hidden the key behind the lock. So the key is right there behind the lock. But people never experience the probability of actually checking the lock and finding the key out. So if they had done it, they would have success, right? But they try to look at crazy places under the chair, on top of the door and everything, but they completely disregard that probability. So that's where the mind plays tricks on us. You know, we are uncertain, there is a probability, but we don't explore that option. Oh, it's a tongue twister. Uh, it's called inattentional blindness. So rather explaining this to you guys, let me put a small puzzle in front of you. Here's a uh, playing cards in front of you. And your task is to correctly add the numbers to get the two-digit code. So if you can take a stab at it and let me know the right answer. 15, all right. Anybody? 14. 14, all right. People also ask a very relevant question sometimes. That ace, you know, is it 1 or 11? So imagine the ace equals 11. 59. 59. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. OK, good. So we have different answers, and again, they're all good efforts, right? But here we are playing tricks with your mind, and your mind is actually playing tricks on you. And that's what is called inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness is not related to any physical defect or deficit, but it's not observing things which are right in front of you, or the anomalies, right? So actually, the answer to this question is, what was the answer? <laughs> I love you when you relate back to me. 29, OK. The answer is 21. Because see, here I asked you to correctly add. Now, if you look at the cards, there is an anomaly right in front of your eyes. The heart suite is always red. The four of hearts right in front of five of hearts, but it is black. So you need to discard the four of black hearts. It's an anomaly. So you discard it 5 plus 5, 10 plus 11, 21. So the answer is 21. Okay. This, one, this was not a printing mistake. It was intentional. So we did it intentionally so that you can experience inattentional blindness. Don't worry, I got it wrong as well. <laughs> yeah. And I work with him. So. And see, the thing what happens is that you know, when you go under pressure, and sometimes this twist comes in front of you, you do crazy stuff. You know, you do crazy stuff. Yes, seeing people saying, oh, this two of diamond, the diamond size is slightly smaller. You know, why is it small? But the four of hearts is the real thing, real deal. Okay, so we have subject expectancy effect. So that is basically for your mind to move on and not focus on the solution that you've got, just gotten. So you've solved a puzzle 
which is actually leading you to the exit code or the solution to your final puzzle. But when you do the first part of it, your mind goes like, no, I don't think this is relevant. We need to look somewhere else. So your mind has just <whistles> gone somewhere else, which is, which if you look at it, mm, you know, if you had focused on the target and task given to you, you would have progressed. For example, you're given a puzzle in which your final exit code has to be a four digit. It's a four digit lock that you have to open. So the mind automatically says, okay, I'm, li I'm looking for numbers. But the puzzle you're solving is actually revealing letters. Your mind will never click given that you're under that constraint of time and pressure that letters can be transposed onto numbers. So what the mind does is you solve the first part of the puzzle, and you're like, oh my God, it's a letter. Can't be it, look somewhere else. You haven't even bothered. Well, bothered would be the wrong word, but you haven't even continued and to see what else would be revealed. So that is what basically your subject expectancy effect is. And actually, I have heard people say, keep calm boys, keep calm team, and look somewhere else. The answer would be somewhere else, but actually the answer was in the thing which they were working on. The guy says, you know, I'm not superstitious either, but those were the three days Harris wore his lucky shoes. <laughs> actually, it's right. <laughs> he wore his lucky shoes, shoes and the sales were higher. But no, but that's what we are trying to make a point here, illusionary correlation. People and our minds, you know, sometimes when they know that, you know, they have to solve puzzles, they have to escape from the room, and there's no other way out, then they just try to correlate two seemingly unrelated things to others. For example, you know, there's a key, of course, the key goes into a lock. So that's a logical correlation, right? If there's a four digit lock and you have to open it, so the logic says you have to find four digits. So for example, you know, we have a writing board for players to write their notes on or their progress on so that you know, they can progress and go back to these things. And we have some magnet boards, magnets on those boards. And we have a red color chair in the room. So they look at it and say, ah, there are three red color uh, magnets on the board and there's a red chair. So three plus one is equal to four. So our first answer is four, or the first, right? But, it, but no, but we never anticipated that anybody is going to make that correlation between two things which we actually never thought of. But people think about those correlations and then try to relate those two things together and progress in the, in the game or in whatever they are doing and they get stuck. And when in the end they find the right answer, they say, what the hell we were thinking? Remember in class when your teacher would tell you to work in separate groups, especially in math, since they come up with the answer? You always have that one person in the group, that smarty pant, who goes like, once it's solved, he's like, aha, I knew that was the answer. Okay, so that is basically what hindsight bias is. It's when a person honestly believes that they were right. But the question is, if you were right, why didn't you solve it? <laughs> so that is basically the mind saying to that person, you knew it, you knew it, you knew it, but in essence, you weren't actually helping the team or yourself while, when it came to progress within the game. And then they, they say, as they say, hindsight bias is always 20 by 20 or six by six. So the, the, the team member, you know, they honestly believe that you know, they knew the answer. But as Sarah mentioned that you know, if you knew it all along, why didn't you execute it? But the, the key is that mind says, you knew it, you knew it, you knew it. And then they honestly believe that they knew the answer. Most of you, I, I do it all the time, but most of you guys you know, would have seen shapes or objects into things. Have you ever done that? For example, if you see some, something and then you say, ah, there's a smiley face there. It means that you, know, you have a well-connected mind. A well-connected mind tries to see shapes or things into different objects. Let's take example of our beautiful moon. So if I encourage you to look into this moon and tell me you know, what shapes do you see, don't be afraid. If you see shapes, it means you're good. We've if eliminated. We've you seen eliminated that, right? the probability there are any ones. Sorry? Crab. A crab, yeah, okay. Crab. That's a first. Okay. That's a first. There's a rabbit? I see a dragon. Dragon, really? I too. like you. Yeah. <laughs> Fan <laughs> fantasy. Yeah, I love fantasy. I love fantasy, yeah. A person doing yoga. Yoga. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Even more. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So yeah, so these are the things, you know, whereby we look, same people, you know, when they look at, a, at an object or thing, they, their mind perceives different objects and different things. And I'll just give you some of the examples. So some of them were 
new to us as well. For example, Ant was new. Somebody said, somebody said a dragon. Brilliant. You know, I will ask you to explain. Or would you like to come and explain? You know, how do you see a dragon there? Look, here's the head, mm -hmm. and eye, and there's the body. Here's and the Okay. <laughs> no, no, I see it now. No, true, I see it now. Brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. Okay, so these are the different things people have seen, you know. Somebody has seen a fallen down Eskimo. Now, if you look at the picture, you'll see it now. Some people have actually seen a rabbit. Here's a rabbit. Now, if you see, the rabbit is there. But it's our moon. There's no rabbit, right? But it's there. Some people have seen, my, my daughter actually sees this face in this shape. Yeah. And some people, you know, they had brilliant imagination, brilliant creative side. They see intricacy and detail in the moon, you know. They say, praise the God, he has done brilliant stuff. They see a beautiful woman with all those details in the moon. So I hope, you know, that's the end of our presentation that, you know, we have been able to give you some of our insights and our observations of how the mind works how the mind plays tricks on us, and how the mind does magic, and people actually get out of the room. Thank you very much.